Okay, so good morning, everybody. <coughs> so welcome to the pitch session of this uh, fifth slate interdisciplinary week. Okay, so during this session, we will have uh, uh, pitches from 10 groups of students from uh, various master's program and engineering school. <coughs> so not all pitches will have the same duration because the size of each group of students is not the same and uh, thus the amount of work to be presented is not the same. Uh, so you have to know that uh, on Friday 15 January at noon, uh, the prize for the best pitch will be awarded by the jury composed of Isabelle Verrier, which is here. Uh, we don't we don't see maybe you can say hello to activate your window. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, 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 Emily Morvan also from, from computer science. Uh, François Royer and myself. Okay. And uh, so, uh, yes, uh, <clears throat> if you have any question about uh, the work presented by students, you can ask your question in the chat. Okay. So all the questions will be uh, delivered after the talk of the student. Okay. So uh, either I will read the, the chat or I will uh, gi give the the talk to, to the person who wants to to ask a question. <clears throat> so it's time now to let the first group present its work. So let me introduce Romain Bacri and Clotilde Pio. Hello. Okay. You can you can talk. So hello everyone. Uh, Romain and I will open the pitch session by presenting to you our lot the work subjects uh, on search for biomarkers for synovial fluid by image processing. Um, the subject was... Hello. Okay. Uh, the subject was brought to us by Synodiag, uh, which is a project of startup launched by Pulsa Les Saint-Etienne Lyon in partnership with uh, Vetsup Agro. Vet Agro. The, sub, uh, the Synodiag uh, project aims at providing a little invasive and early diagnosis of osteoarthrosis thanks to synovial fluid analysis. To understand what synovial fluid is and its role in osteoarthrosis uh, diagnosis, um, we, we must know that osteoarthrosis is a second cause of consultation after heart disease, even though they are not linked, and that patients over 60 years old are very likely to be touched. Now, what is this illness? Uh, it consists in a negative change in the properties of the now famous synovial fluid, which originally is in charge of lowering the frictions and shocks in the joints. Uh, it, it is in contact with the joints tissues and therefore witnesses uh, how healthy these really are. To study this fluid's properties, Synodiac's method is as follows. Um, synovial fluid is sampled uh, is sampled in a joint and dried by following a certain process. Pictures of the dried drops are then taken under a microscope. The aim of the study is to find different features that could allow to separate sane and pathological drops and ideally to identify different osteoarthrosis types. For our lab work, we were given a set of three images, three sane and three pathological, with the same objective. We noticed that all drops were composed of a kernel filled with fern-like structures, surrounded by an inner ring, more chaotic, and finally an outer ring in which we noticed a radial tubes of various shapes between sane and pathological drops. On one hand, we could isolate the kernel of the drops uh, and try different computations, such as Minkowski boligo fractal uh, or lo local entropy computations. Uh, sadly, these operations gave no remarkable result, but they are very interesting for the future. Then, by isolating the inner ring and computing the ratio between the inner ring diameter and the drop diameter, we could find that this ratio is potentially significant uh, for the diagnosis of osteoarthrosis um, with a lower ratio for same drops. 
Another tool we used was um, local entropy filtering, uh, which is um, a filter that will um, give to every pixel a value according to uh, the amount to how disordered his neighborhood is. Uh, the interesting with that filter is that, is that it allows us to give different shades to different zones. So every zone will have, uh, according to how disordered they are. Um, uh, what's interesting is that using entropy filtering, we could then um, analyze those pictures uh, very, uh, and that will give us very really useful data. Um, next slide. Uh, one of uh, well, the main analysis we used was radial average uh, on the entropy pictures. That is um, to say, the radial average will will calculate the average A intensity uh, going from the center to the outside of the picture. Uh, which is what is interesting with this is that, uh, as we see on the graph, we can uh, isolate different zones as we did using on the naked eye. Uh, and from this, we can compute a new ratio, which is uh, significant uh, and which is quite similar to the one we calculated previously. Next. Uh, so as we saw, we have two methods and two results uh, that are quite similar. Uh, which is very interesting because from this we can conclude two things that a uh, radial average study is pertinent because we using a graph we see the same things that we saw only using the naked eye and that radial average uh, study uh, allows us to actually put a number on what when we saw with the naked eye um, with actual graphs mm. So in conclusion, uh, what we worked on was uh, isolating the kernel, which didn't really work, work out, but was interesting for future analysis. Uh, and uh, the most important thing we did was um, find a way to quantify the ratios of the rings uh, and inner rings, uh, even though we only had six samples that has to be confirmed on a larger database but uh, and uh, we have shown that we could use many interesting tools that the startup didn't think of. Uh, so in the future, what we thought might be interesting would maybe work on um, how the pictures were taken, on making sure that every picture was eliminated the same way when taken, and um, maybe use pro um, optical properties like um like polarized uh, light to discover more about the structures so thank you very much everyone uh if you have any questions okay thank you for your presentation <clears throat> so i don't know if so on the chat there is no question at the moment so we don't hesitate to ask yeah. a question maybe someone from your mic what so oh, yeah. can uh, Ask with the mic if they want. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, ah. I have one, please, Francois. Yes. Uh, yes, Francois Royer. Okay. You, you have mentioned that you obtain a, a ratio at the end. And is this ratio significant enough to be used directly? Well, the point is that, um, in our opinion, this is a good track. But with only six samples, it's very hard to say whether the figures are significant or not. Uh, even though we have very interesting um, uncertainties on the ratios, th this must be confirmed, as we said in conclusion. And uh, we know that this study is going to be um, is, is, go is going to is going to go on uh, for at least uh, two months now, and uh, these these uh, data should be should be confirmed or not. Okay. Thank you. So the, the size of the database you could use, uh, 
do you have information about that? I think so, was, uh, uh, actually we had only six pictures yeah, to but, compare, uh, yeah. but um, the the study that is going to to take place in the mm. in the few next months uh, should work on around fifteen to thirty pictures. So this is quite significant, I believe. Okay. Thank you. So thank you again for your presentation. So now we are going to uh, listen Emmanuel Kim and David Rada. Uh, so please, could you share your screen you. and open your cam? So. Hello. 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 So at the moment, we don't see any screen. So who is sharing the screen? Uh, you can uh, you can do it, David. Yes, yeah, that's it. Okay. Yeah. So So for other speakers, you have to decide before your turn who is going to share his screen because it takes time. So. Yeah. Sorry. So you can put it in full screen if you can. Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, if it's PDF, you can hit uh, Control L. Oh, no. Uh, is it, it's okay, is this or? Okay. We will do it like this. It's, uh, it's a pity, but uh, we will do it like this. We don't have time. Uh, okay. okay, so you can you can begin your presentation. So I'm Emmanuel and this is David Rodin. We are from uh, Institute Optic Graduate School. And today we are going to talk to you about our last school project. It's about measuring gloss of surfaces in order to investigate the degradations of pierre soulage. Next. So, is pierre soulage, and uh, here are some of his paintings. He's a famous painter and he likes to alternate glossy and matte surfaces on his works. Next. So uh, our work is under the di direction of Pauline Nelou de la Grandière, restaurator of Pierre Soulage work. And during her work, she observed that there were variations of gloss before degradations and some glossy surfaces becoming matte and matte surfaces becoming glossy. So here are the degradations. Next. So the goal of our project is to quantify the variations of gloss of the surfaces and to construct an, a prototype that will uh, do that. Next. So there are different ways of measuring the gloss. We can use a commercial gloss meter, but uh, there is a problem. We need a device with no contact. We can use a BRDF and analyze in all directions the quantity of light reflected by the surface. But there is a problem. We need a device to be transportable in a museum. Next. So our idea is to study the specular gloss. It's the visual, visual property of a surface and uh, it describes the appearance of the surface in relation to the quantity of light uh, reflected uh, in the specular direction. So here you have a, you have a, a drawing of the, the uh, analyzing of uh, specular gloss. Here you have the source, uh, the detector. Uh, in red, you have the light emitted by the source and uh, in uh, yellow, all the light uh, reflected by the surface. Uh, the analyzing is made with the uh, source and detector, each one from uh, 60 degrees from the normal in according to the EASTM norm. Uh, the specular gloss depends on the reflectivity in the specular direction from a sample and from a reference. Next. Uh, it's, it is measured in gloss unit and it's going from zero to 100. Zero is for extremely matte surfaces and uh, 100 for a specular surface, perfectly glossy surface. Next. 
So our new method will be to use the image of the reflection of a source point. So how, how can we detect an optical signal? So for this, we use this setup uh, using a point source, which is going to reflect on a color chart that we can see here. Uh, this color chart uh, will reflect light uh, in the direction of the camera uh, with diffusion and uh, uh, specular directivity. Uh, so this is uh, the photo of the setup. As you can see, uh, we have uh, uh, the, the same light source, uh, the color chart on the wall. Um, all the color charts were placed uh, close to each other. And uh, then uh, ca the camera, which is going to detect the optical signal and the movable platform uh, used uh, to uh, analyze all the, uh, the uh, samples. So uh, these are the um, measures we, we have done uh, by analyzing the reflex, the reflection of all um, samples. So as you can see, the more the surface is uh, glossy, the smaller is the signal. Uh, and uh, to the contrary, uh, the more the surface is diffusing, uh, the bigger it, it, it is. So um, we have a really sharp image for um, uh, glossy surfaces, but a really blurry image, as you can see for G6, for example, uh, in the case it is more diffusing. Uh, so we used uh, the quantification of uh, the, we quantify the gloss using the variation of intensity in the image. To do this, we selected a colon uh, on our images. Uh, which is uh, going uh, through the center of uh, each uh, pro uh, so each images, and thanks to it we uh, get a, a profile intensity of the pixel, and uh, this uh, intensity uh, is a vi is variating uh, really quickly or not if it's more diffusing or uh, matte uh, or um, uh, reflecting. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, we quantify the variation um, by measuring the derivative of uh, what we saw just before. And thanks to it, uh, we were able to uh, make a bijective uh, uh, correlation between the gloss unit and the derivative of our maximas. And uh, to have the first uh, scale of uh, the gloss, which was our goal. So it is a new method to characterize the goal, the gloss, uh, with, uh, without an ambient light. We, uh, we observed a bijection between the gloss uh, perceived by the camera and the, um, and the uh, samples. Uh, it is contactless and removable. Uh, and adapted to sample of large imaging, such as uh, paintings, for example. And the project will continue. Uh, for example, we can investigate uh, ambient light uh, to continue. Thank you for your attention. Uh, don't hesitate if you have uh, any questions. OK, thank, thank you. you. <coughs> so uh, maybe I have a question. I don't really understand how you can measure the degradation of a work. Uh, using this technique, uh, because uh, you have no idea of, for example, the level of gloss of the work at the beginning of its life. So how can you, so you can measure the level of gloss at a particular moment, but you don't know if it's better or worse that, uh, than at the beginning. So how do you do? Uh, one of the major point of the, the project is, is uh, to have a, a prototype that will be viable in time, okay. uh, as the time pa is passing. So, uh, for example, for all uh, for the 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 next steps of the project, it will be to uh, take photos, for example, of the gloss scales or from uh, paintings, and in the same condi conditions each time. For example, uh, at day one, we will uh, take photos, and uh, six months after. Ah. With the same conditions, we will take a photo, and so 
with the with the pass of time we will see if there is a major variations of gloss at uh, at this point or this point okay okay nice okay thank you so uh, i don't know if someone has some question we don't i think there much. was a question about the application i think um well uh we can use it uh, so for, for example as you as, as you saw here for the um, quantification of uh, the degradation of paintings but um, it can be used uh, maybe for other type of paintings here it was uh, monochromatic uh, paintings um, but uh, yes basically it can be used for um, some application which will um, uh, which will need uh, contactless uh, measurement of uh, loss. Okay, thank you. So we will have we we have to stop here because we have still eight other pitches. Thank you okay. very much for this work and this presentation. Uh, so now it's time for Luca Goncalves and Leo Jourdi to present their work. So maybe you can switch on your cam and share the screen. Nice. So you can put it in full screen. Ah, yes, thank you. OK, it's perfect, so you can talk. Aesthetic has become a central parameter in our life, and we know that teeth can be important. We know that teeth are fluorescent, so uh, to get the same color and the same degree of fluorescence for our teeth and dental materials, uh, and that's why we study dental materials. Our goal is to quantify the degree of fluorescence in these dental composites. To do this, we studied uh, dental composites and white paper, and we will explain later why we used white paper. We use uh, this spectrophotometer, which takes measurement with UV light and without UV light. This spectrophotometer measures the reflectance, the percentage of reflected light, and the transmittance, the percentage of transmitted light. We first use the Cobalt Kamok model. It's a model that allows to study the propagation of light in matter by taking into account absorption and scattering coefficient k and s. Uh, so this coefficient uh, is uh, those coefficients are used to predict the reflectance of the transmittance our materials. Uh, which Kubel Kamong by studying a single thickness uh, of a materials, it's possible to predict the interaction with light of these uh, materials for different thicknesses. More specifically, it makes it possible uh, to predict the color of a mixture of two dyes if the absorption and scattering parameter are known. We measure uh, the reflectance and the transmittance of the dental materials for a few thicknesses, 1.2, 1.0, 0 0.8, and 0 0.4 millimeter. And thanks to the kubel kamuk model, and from the 1.2 millimeter sample, uh, we found the reflectance and the transmittance of the other. In, you can see on the graph, in the abscissa, there is the wavelength, and on the ordinate, there is a transmittance for the graph uh, at the bottom and the reflectance for the graph at the top. The theoretical curve is in black and the measurement is in red. You can see that we note a DE76 value. It's a color difference evaluation metric. And above 2.2, the color difference is significant. Thus, uh, the 0 0.4 millimeter sample prediction is not acceptable. We found that the theoretical uh, reflectance and transmittance are always inferior to the experimental values. In fact, the classical model doesn't take into account the fluorescence remissions of light. 
We study also white paper because it's much more fluorescent than dental composites, which have a low degree of fluorescence. If we can predict the fluorescence uh, in the paper, normally there will be no problem for dental materials. We wanted to do the same as dental materials and show the diff uh, difference between the theoretical curves and the experimental curves. We observed that the reflectance of the paper is greater than one uh, because the white paper is very fluorescent. Uh, there is a light transfer of uh, 400 nanometers to 500 nanometers. That's why uh, we are upper than one. Uh, the model translates uh, this into a negative K absorption and therefore no longer works. We can't compare the experimental curves and the theoretical curves. Uh, so in the rest of our study, we only used paper and did not use dental materials. We found a discrete uh, fluorescence cobalt amount model. Uh, this discrete fluorescence model consists of substrating, uh, substitution of the contribution from UV light to predict the reflectance and the transmittance without a fluorescence re-emission of light. And it consists of modeling in a succession of layers. To make uh, the contribution, uh, we measured the difference between the values with the UV light and the values without UV light. And we did the, the difference between them. Uh, and thanks to a formula, we can deduce the contribution for any layers, uh, any number of layers. Thus, we could be able to determine the reflectance and the transmittance by subtracting uh, the contribution of, fluor of the fluorescence to the values. Unfortunately, we have an issue in the computations uh, of the reflectance and the transmittance between 4 and 500 nanometers. Uh, even with the discrete model, we still have a gap between the theoretical curve and the experimental curves. Uh, we think that uh, there is a visible to visible fluorescence. That's why when we remove the UV, we, alway, we always have this problem of deviation from our theoretical curves. Uh, in addition, we may also need to consider the interfaces between the layers of paper. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your presentation. Okay, so I don't know if someone has some question <coughs> from the jury or from the participants. We don't have much time, but if you have one question, maybe. I have just one about the, th yeah. the thickness you are using in the model. I have understood that you were using thickness less than one millimeter. I will say that in, in a practical case with a, with a tooth, uh, we can say that the thickness is much larger than that, you will only use a reflectant signal, no? Uh, in fact, yes, uh, we, we can vote that a teeth are more, uh, are thicker uh, than uh, one millimeter. Uh, but actually, uh, if we cannot predict a uh, sample, uh, less uh, than one millimeter, uh, it's not really uh, interesting for a real, uh, a real uh, dental composites uh, with a great um, thickness. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, yes, so we have one question on, on the chat, but we will not reply, sorry for Richard Serrano, we will not reply to this question because uh, we are beginning to be late. <laughs> uh, thank you for your presentation. And uh, so now let me introduce Corentin Le Talec and uh, Antoine Piello. So you can switch on your cam and uh, share your screen with us. Yes. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, yeah, I see you. 
should wear a mask if you are on the, in the same room. Yes, we do in a colloque, so... Uh, we'll live together. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay, so we see your screen. So we don't see you anymore, but uh, maybe it's because of the of the network, maybe. So the most interesting part is uh, is your slide. Yes. So you can uh, you can begin your talk. Thank you. Okay. So we will present you our project on the relationship between speckle and BRGF. Uh, this project deals with the limit of classical photonic material appearance measurement. The surface condition of a material impacts the visual aspect of its surface. To characterize this surface, there is a concept called the bidirectional reflection distribution function, uh, the BRGF. Uh, this, function, this function is useful for computer-generated imagery, as we can see uh, on the right of uh, the slide. Uh, the planner, the surface, the more it looks like a mirror, the more it is, the more matte it looks like. So on the, we can see on the left, uh, rose surface, which is a uh, diffuse, and on the right, uh, a mirror. The BRGF is a function of the incident wave vector, of the reflected vector, and of the wavelength. Thus, to be precise on the wavelength and the incidence, we are tempted to by the use of a laser. But the BRGF is defined for spatially and temporally coherent light, and a laser is very spatially uh, coherent. Uh, because of this, uh, we can observe a phenomenon due to infer interferences called a speckle. So, a classic uh, light source uh, emits uh, an incoherent light. Uh, as the schema shows, uh, the response is uh, disordered. And the uh, laser, uh, which is uh, the source uh, we use, is a coherent uh, light and uh, has a parallel uh, wavefront, so it will uh, inter uh, interfere uh, differently with uh, the surfaces. Uh, so the consequence of, uh, of uh, use the laser, uh, so with an incoherent light, uh, the BRGF, uh, as a function of the angle of incidence, is a Gaussian, uh, so it's uh, the black curve, uh, but with a current light, light uh, like uh, our laser, uh, we get a curve similar to the red curve, uh, which has uh, the same envelope uh, as the Gaussian uh, of incoherent light, but with uh, vari variations. So in 2D image, uh, this corresponds to the two images below the curve. So the resulting image, so on the right, is a uh, very grainy. It is a real problem of uh, granulometry. Uh, one way to solve this problem, problem is uh, to average. It has to reduce the angular resolution of the detector. But by doing uh, so, the resolution of the measure is reduced at the same time. So if you want to stay uh, at a very high angular resolution, uh, you cannot avoid a speaker. However, you can measure several speaker uh, figures in different places on the surface and take the average. Uh, so our goal uh, in this project was to find uh, how many photos we need to take uh, to take uh, to find uh, this image. So what's about our experiment? <coughs> we use a source of light uh, which eliminated a known material. Uh, which is a light laser. Um, the incident beam of light passes through different optical components uh, that have an impact on the beam. The mi microscope lens focalizes the beam and the collimator uh, made rays such more parallel than before this component. The last lens focalizes the beam on the sample where the light is reflected and we coked the reflected beam with the light sensor, a camera uh, in the dark. That we observe is a pattern which is more luminous at its center, and we did it in several positions of the sample. Here, there are some results we got. 
first we can observe that other pictures are looking like others, but if we look closely at them, we can conclude that all of them are really different. The points are different, at different places, with different intensities. But uh, when we look at the same place on the sample, we observe the same diffraction figure. Um, for our study, uh, we took a small area uh, in the center of the picture uh, where we studied, studied statistics. First, uh, we have analyzed the center of uh, one image and we have got the histogram of uh, the number of pixels as a function of the pixel value values. Then we have taken uh, three pictures uh, centers and we have got three histograms that we average to obtain this one. And uh, the histogram of, uh, and uh, after that, we have done the same work uh, with uh, 60 images. According to the speckle theory, uh, when we get an image, the histogram of the gray scale are following a gamma law, as you can observe on uh, another sample uh, on the right. Uh, the sample uh, is uh, more matte than the first one. Um, according to the statistics theory, uh, the higher is a gamma low order, the most it tends to be a Gaussian low. And uh, in our case, case uh, that happens when we increase the number of pictures we get. And if we continue to arrange more images, we would obtain an even narrower Gaussian with a grayscale value that would match the BRD value. So uh, the first conclusion we can do is that if we keep averaging more image, we'll get the value of the BRDF, but this requires uh, using a very large number of image. So our second conclusion is that 60 images are not enough. Moreover, this value uh, depends on the surface state, and for a lot of sample, we just arrived to get a gamma low, which is not enough. However, uh, we can wonder that what will happen if we use a very large number of pictures. In fact, the Gaussian will become always narrower until to be one pixel large, and we also get the weird value, such as uh, the right uh, schema. Thank you. Thanks to the Elenek Nam for that project and thank you for your attention. Thank, <coughs> thank you for your presentation. <coughs> so, uh, so there is a question in the chat. So there is a, well, there is an echo with your take care. So uh, there is a question from uh, one of your colleagues. So maybe you can see it. In the chat, is it a gamma low for one sample and then as the number of samples used increases, it tends toward a Gaussian distribution? So maybe you can answer this question. Uh, yes. Um, indeed, uh, when we take one picture, uh, the distribution uh, tends to follow gamma low. Um, uh, but uh, if we take several pictures um, it uh, the distribution is following also a gamma low but with an higher order and uh, when we take a lot of uh, images more than uh, i don't know 40 or 50 uh, we get a, a distribution uh, as a gaussian low uh, but uh, if we want to uh, obtain uh, the va value of the BRDF, uh, the Gaussian uh, must be uh, very, very narrow. So uh, we need a lot of uh, images. Okay, thank you. Uh, so if so, it's a good idea. If you have uh, any other question, you can ask them in the chat, and then the. Uh, the speakers may uh, reply in the chat as they did uh, for the previous uh, presentation. It was a nice answer in the chat. 
Uh, thank you. So now we are having three uh, pitches from the master machine learning and data mining. Uh, so first, the first presentation will be uh, done by uh, Levi Montero Martins. And uh, this presentation will be a little bit longer than uh, the other one because he will present uh, the context of the work of the three groups from this uh, master. Okay. So I think. Uh, Good morning, everyone. So, Levi, uh, yes, okay, you are online. It's okay. You can talk. Can I start? Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Levi Marchins. I'm a second year in the program uh, of Master in Machine Learning Data Mining. And I'm representing the team Minions. Today, I'm going to present you about the DEFI IA challenge, which is a challenge that takes place yearly, and all students of the second year in this master program took part in it. So, the last edition, we had more than 10 French institutions that took part in it, and we had more than 1,000 submissions and more than 200 competitors. Now, let's understand a little bit more about the challenge given to us. Well, imagining you are giving this sentence. The goal here is to build models that can predict by this sentence, which is the job, the job label for this sentence. For instance, we create a model that, uh, based on this sentence, this model can say that this is a nurse. But what if we decide to, to replace the gender, the explicit gender indicators, such as the personal pronouns, she for he, and the same model start giving us that this is not a nurse and it's actually a doctor. Well, this is a problem that is explicitly related to this challenge, which is to design a solution that is both accurate as well as fair with respect to the gender for the assignment of a job category to a given job description. This is a multi-class classification task with, more, with 28 different jobs. A little bit about our data set. The data set was composed of three different features, the description, the gender, and the category that could be between these 28 different labels, pastor, model, professors, and etc. The train uh, set was composed of more than 200,000 stains, and it was the set that we used mainly to build our models, and the test set with more than 50,000 stains was the one that we sent uh, for final computing of our scores in the competition. In order to evaluate the evaluation metrics adopted by this challenge, uh, we need to understand that a classification model, uh, for instance, in this case, let's suppose we have a classification model that identifies which, if a given instance is a nurse or not a nurse, we a model can give four different outputs from this for a given instance. It can identify, for instance, for a doctor instance, that this is not a nurse, which is a case of a true negative case, or, or a model can also identify for a doctor instance that you uh, you are a nurse. In this case, you have a false positive case. Or a model that can predict that a nurse is actually a nurse, which is correctly classified, so it's a true positive. Or a model can also predict that a nurse is not a nurse. Understanding this, we can also compute the precision, which is the ability of a classifier to find the positive examples over all the positive cases, including the ones that are the false, false positives. Also, we can compute the, the, the recall of the model, which is the ability of the classifier to find the positive examples that were correctly classified. Once we have these two metrics, we now can compute what is called the F1, the macro F1, we compute this by the multiplication of the precision and recall and their divisions of their sum. And we compute this for all the 28 different classes. And then we calculate the arithmetic mean in order to have a general view of how the models behave for the whole classes. Another metric uh, adopted during this challenge is the fairness metric. The fairness metric is the average demographic parity that we compute for all classes. Let's suppose a model computes that uh, uh, for a surgeon job, we have 80, 90, uh, more than 800 cent, uh, centers identified as female and more than 5,000 identified as male. So we compute the maximum between these two and we divide by their mean. The goal here is to find the closest as possible to one. 
We compute this uh, among other classes and then we compute the average of it. Now, let's talk about the data process and the data, the data augmentation techniques that me and my teams adopted. For the given uh, trained data, we decided to, uh, to use three different types of filtering and to have three variations of the data. A more simple one where we remove some, we lower case and we remove some symbols and we also remove some stop words and understand here that the English stop words, they are, they, they are the words that had, they are explicitly gender indicators such as personal pronouns and possessive pronouns. And for the second future, we decide to use natural language recognition to identify for each sentence which word is a person or a proper noun. And also we add order rejects matching to refer to remove formal terms that could point out to the towards gender. In addition to this, we also apply the filter one to this on top of the filter two, and we also remove some hand, uh, some words that that we pick up from handicraft to uh, dictionary that can point out to gender such as sport man, uh, sports woman, share man. And for the third variation, we decide to, re to replace the degrees of abbreviations to its expansions and also to add a more thoroughly rejects matching. And in this variation, we also we use, we use a data augmentation technique in order to overcome the data imbalance uh, that I'm going to talk to you in the next slide. This is our example of our, the instance that we have in our train set with their jobs and the amounts that we have. As you can see, there is a huge imbalance problem here. We have a lot of instances of professors and almost any instance of dentist, rapper, and etc. So in order to over overcome this challenge, our team decided to use a data augmentation technique that is called back translation, which we translate a, sing a sentence in a language A to a language B, and then we back translate it to the same language, and we apply to on top of this paraphrasing in order to add diversity of, our, of sentence structure in our data. Now let's talk a little bit about our models and results. Well, it's important to understand the first what are neural networks here. Neural networks, they were mainly inspired by modeling biological neural systems. And you can understand here that a single neuron, it can be understood as a linear classifier where its output can be also be the input of other neurons. And here in this figure, you see an example of a three layers uh, neural network. For our models, we use more complex neural network, which is also known as deep neural networks with more hidden hidden layers with more than a thousand million parameters. This we use three different architectures, and but they are mainly based in what is called the transformer architecture. Well, in this transformer architecture, we can parse the whole sentence and they rely mainly in what is called an attention mechanism, which can allow us to a given input data to add weights that can further have an impact within its hidden layers downstream. So we use BERT, Roberta, and BART. And BERT is a bidirectional encoder where random talks of a sentence is, they are replaced by a mask and the objective of the model is to predict the, the tokens that were mislabeled. This allows us to keep the, the context in two directions, left, right, and right to left. The other one was the robust bird, which is uh, based on bird, but here the, the robust bird or Berta, the parameters were modified in a way that we can have a more optimized approach and there is no use of some layers that were used in the bidirectional in the bird. The other one was the BART architecture, which is basically a generalization of BERT because it also has a bidirectional encoder model, but now we have an addition of an autoregressive decoder that picks up the, the output of the bidirectional encoder and uses to calculate the likelihood of the right part of uh, the, the output of the decoder, the encoder. So the building blocks of our models we have four different variations of the data, three that we apply the filters and one that we do not process it. We decide to develop many models changing a lot of parameters and we pick up the best models of it to apply to different uh, voting techniques for our final predictions. 
First, the soft voting, which uh, we it consists of the multiple combinations of the logits of our models. We sum them up and then we pick up the average and then we use it as a final prediction, but also the hard voting. This in this figure you see the best combination that we got for for the hard voting process. And you can see we combine uh, four, four or five different models and we got a score of 80 percent of F1 and a fairness score of 3.54. Another, another, the other approach, the soft voting, uh, the best combination that we got was between the BERT, the Roberta and the BERT, and with the variations of the data one and the variations of the data non preprocessed And actually this gave us a, 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 the score that make us reach the eighth position in the rank. And it's unfortunately the fairness increased a little bit, but it gave us a, a, a good a good result. So this is um, the position that we got with this final model. And uh, these are some references that I used. So thank you. And if you have any questions, feel free. Okay, thank you. So just one question, question if someone has one question, because we are late. If you have other questions, you can ask them on the in the chat and uh, the speaker will reply in the chat. Okay, so thank you for this presentation. So as I said, uh, this presentation is longer than the next two one because it presented the, the whole challenge. So now we welcome Camille Brami, which, uh, who will present another way to solve this problem. Hello, everyone. So you can switch on your, okay, it's okay. We, uh, so yeah. maybe you can put your, yeah, it's nice. You okay. can begin. So, so we were also part of the Kaggle competition and our team was named uh, and today we are going to present you our results. So like uh, Team Minions, we use the soft voting architectures made of uh, transform pre-trained uh, transformer models that we fine tune for this uh, classification task. And uh, okay, so for the soft voting, each model we output uh, a vector. So we have 28 classes. So the size of the vector will be 28 and each uh, uh, slot will represent the probability of uh, how much the model believes that uh, the X belongs to the corresponding uh, class. So this is some results of our best uh, models. As you can see, we we, uh, we have some great results, but but by combining them uh, with votes, we get better results, and uh, we get way much better results when it comes to uh, soft voting. But uh, in this competition, we had another constraint, which is the fairness. And unfortunately, uh, the majority vote uh, did not really uh, impact the fairness. So we had to find another way to tackle the problem. And uh, as you can see, the minimum we can get to, to, uh, with the fairness score is one. So our goal was to get as close as possible to one. So to, uh, to do so, we decided to use a bias a post, uh, post processing uh, method, which is the bias injection. So uh, by using a bias injection function, there's two ways to control uh, this, by the way we compute the bias and also the way we compute the bias injection function. So we, we try a several a bunch of uh, combination between bias and uh, bias injection functions, and we kept the best one. So this is our bias function, which, which is just the difference between male for the, the class I and female uh, over the, the size of the class. So if it's positive, it means that there is more male than female, and uh, negative, more female than male. And this is our bias implementation functions. So it's the bias times the gender, and we want to push the bias to the opposite direction of uh, the major majority gender. So the gender will be the opposite sign of the bias, and will be 1 or minus 1. And the weight is just how intense we want the bias to be. And it seems to work pretty well. So with the same architecture, with the we can, we, as you can see, when the weight is equal to zero, we get the uh, the same score. 
uh, that we have on the leaderboard. And as we increase the weight, we get a, a score that uh, that is uh, low. But uh, in terms of fairness, we gain a lot. But there is also an interesting result that you can notice is by uh, increasing the fairness, we can keep at the beginning um, the same score. So now uh, we are going to explain you how we improved our majority voting because it was not good enough to get uh, uh, to the podium. So we try to find another solution. So I will explain it to you with simple uh, with only one class. So which is the class zero professor. So we we, we give to uh, to our model models only uh, um, uh, uh, professor labels and we computed the the mean of uh, his vectors, and this allowed us to uh, to see. Um, which classes are the most similar to uh, the class professor? No, there is the class 19 and 21. And then we plotted this in a, we, we project this in a 2D space so we can uh, get something visible. And as you can see, um, all of these uh, samples are, has been classified as uh, professor, whereas they are not professor. Professor is a uh, color purple. So we decided to keep only the five most uh, misclassified uh, classes. And uh, we decided also to uh, augment the data. So f f at first, when we try to uh, classify this data using a simple uh, linear uh, model, which is SVM, which is uh, which use the kernel trick, everything is classified as a professor, which is not good. And when we smooth the data, which means we augment the data at those boundaries, between the classes, you see, you, you can notice that we get a better uh, results. And two, uh, three classes, uh, two classes are missing because they are on the Bayesian error and we can't do anything. So now with a simple architecture, as you can see, uh, Vanilla, which is a, a, neural a simple neural network architecture, we have a F1 score, which is approximately uh, 181.2%. Uh, and when we smooth the data, we get a bit more um, results. And as you can see, we, we, we gain 6%. And but for the, the, the classes that we augmented, we lose, but not so much, which is quite good. So we did this for uh, all the classes. And this led us, so this is a private leader, and this led us to uh, the uh, rank two. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Nice results from your uh, group in this competition. <clears throat> so, is there any question? I don't know. So, your your bias is built by hand by yourself. Uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe you. Have several uh, functions uh, on the internet and also some of them are from us but yes the the bias function is from us yes okay so maybe maybe you could use machine learning to learn this function no um <laughs> yes yes but this is good uh, because it doesn't require a lot of uh, computation by using this kind of function. yeah yeah okay uh, okay so thank you Again, so now let's hear the third group on this uh, specific challenge. So I call Sanmuga Sri Siva Kalidindi. Hello, uh, good morning. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah, and we hear yeah. you. Thank you. And we see your presentation, so you can begin your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sri Kalidindi. I'll be, uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'll be representing the team Seahorse for the same DFIA challenge. Um, uh, like the previous two teams, we are also using a state of the art transfer learning technique where we take uh, the pre trained BERT model and fine tune it for our specific uh, classification task. Um, uh, as presented by uh, Levy, we have a highly imbalanced class uh, data set. Uh, we try to address this by adapting the loss function uh, that is inside these BERT models. 
uh, what we try to instead of uh, augmenting the data we try to adapt the loss function we we we, we took the classical loss function and divided it with the, it with the class weights in this way uh, what we are trying to say to the neural network is that uh, it is more important for you to classify a sample coming from a minority class, a class with very less examples, than classifying a sample coming from a majority class. For example, a class with uh, a lot of uh, examples. So in this way, we try to address uh, the class imbalance pro problem. Um, uh, we also adapted the classical pipeline for the BERT as following. So for every uh, neural network, uh, specifically for a classification task, we have a softmax layer. Uh, what this softmax layer does is that for every sample you uh, put in the network, it tries to calculate the probability that it belongs to a particular class. Here, the classes represent uh, a particular job. So for every sample, uh, there is a probability associated if it belongs to that particular job or not. Uh, in, a, in a usual classification setting, we take the class with the highest probability and assign this uh, class to that particular sample. Uh, uh, this is how the prediction uh, is, uh, a particular sample is labeled. Uh, but instead of stopping here, we try to uh, calculate a score uh, on this uh, probability distribution. So what we tried to do was we took um, the probability of all the classes and calculated a confidence score uh, using entropy over all of these probabilities. What this confidence score tells us is that for every sample that is going through the neural network, how confident are you in classifying this particular sample? Uh, so uh, this confidence score will be higher for the samples where one of the probabilities is very dominant to the other uh, prob to, to the probabilities of the other classes this uh, confidence score will be lower if there are more than one class with more or less similar probabilities so the model is the, the uh, neural network is not sure about uh, classifying it correctly so in this way using this confidence score what we try to do is divide these samples into two categories. The first category, which has uh, the samples with really good confidence scores. And the second category has uh, the samples with bad confidence scores. Uh, what is the whole point of doing this? What can we achieve uh, by splitting these samples? We can do two nice things with this. Uh, using the good samples, we can uh, identify the outliers. Uh, so what we do is we take all the good samples, we, we m match it with the original labels, uh, and we are able to identify the outliers. Outliers or the samples which have, where the label is randomly shuffled. Uh, so using, um, using these confident examples and matching with the original labels, we can find these outliers and remove it from the data. And for the bad samples, we can separate the samples which are really ambiguous, which are really hard to uh, classify. For this, what we try to do is we train, like the other teams, we train um, a lot of BERT models and we perform voting as explained by the uh, previous teams. Uh, these are some of the examples that, ex were, that were extracted from uh, this uh, split of data. So as you can see here, this example has a confidence score of 87. So this is, the, the model is really confident on this example. But as you can see, it is it belongs to more of a software engineer. But in the training label, it is classified as architect. Using the architecture, using the confidence model, we are able to identify these outliers in the data. Uh, one of the example is this one. And the, another example for, that is extracted from the uh, bad confidence samples is uh, this one. As you can see, it is really hard even for a human to classify whether it belongs to a physician or a chiropractor. Uh, 
yeah, what we try to do to, to extract the best uh, metrics, we try voting on these kinds of examples. And as you can see, the confidence score also reflects that, that the model was not confident in uh, classifying this particular example. Uh, now I'll talk about the fairness problem, how we try to achieve it. Uh, so one of the biggest problem we have is that uh, these pre-trained models has gender bias in it while it was trained. We have to somehow neutralize this bias for our classification task. The model should not look at gender sensitive attributes at all. So for this, we converted the single task problem into multitask problem. So we have the same model. It has to do two jobs. The first job is to classify the description into a correct uh, job category. Uh, as you can see on the blue uh, side of the architecture, where the orange side of the architecture tries to neutralize the gender sensitive attributes, where what we try to do here is give him a sample, a description, and we ask him to classify if it belongs to a male or female. Uh, but as you can see, it exonerates the gender uh, sensitive uh, attributes. But for that, what we instead of giving him the right gender label, we give him the gender uh, the, the gender label randomly uh, instead of giving him the true label. In this way, we are neutralizing the connections which are really gender sensitive. Um, uh, this, these are the results that we got, the F1 macro score that we got on uh, uh, different classes. And we go, and finally, we have a F1 score of 80.147 and a failure of uh, 3.7. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. So is there any question from the audience? In the chat, there is no question at the moment, but you can ask any question in the chat if you want, even after the talk. <clears throat> ah. Just wanted to say. Okay. So this is uh, in the chat. We have a comment from the previous presentation. <clears throat> so do not hesitate to look at the chat because there are some interesting comments sometimes. Okay, so thank you for this presentation. So we still have three pitches, so we, it seems that we are quite on time. <clears throat> so now I welcome uh, Watch Our Phone Cause One. If you... Yes, thank you. Uh, can switch on your cam, thanks, and share your screen. Okay. Okay, do you see my screen? Yes. But yes, your presentation, and you can put it in full screen. Okay. Nice. Okay, okay you can begin. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Now I will start. Good morning, all the audience in this session. Uh, my name is Vashra Pungkros Suan as a master student in the SIC program. Today, I'm glad to present my master research under the title uh, Lighting Solution to Assist the Low Vision People in Their Mobility in the part of uh, the environment of spatial distribution of the light with uh, low vision people. Okay, uh, today I will talk about uh, introduction objectives, teaser data, experimental design, and uh, conclusion. Okay, let's start our job. Nowadays, as we well known, eye conditions are exactly the main problem of the population around the world, especially in the older adult. In addition, visual impairment in the low income people look higher than the high income people for allow four times. On the report of uh, low vision, released the statistic of 2.2 uh, billion people live with the visual impairment in their home worldwide. While the number of uh, is released molecular degeneration and low vision people are still increasing every year. As you see from uh, the previous problem, the researchers from uh, Shimane University in Japan are convinced that 
uh, the adaptive environmental clue to the lighting conditions according to the type of uh, visual deficiency could be uh, a relevant solution to improve the visual perception of uh, low vision people. While the researchers from uh, both UJM and Chulalongkorn University in Thailand have also found the impacts of uh, lighting solutions in low vision people. However, uh, these are the first efforts of uh, the development of assistance for low vision. Therefore, um, in order to improve the ability of uh, lighting conditions, we have to go deeper in the theoretical parameter, which will be partially explained in this research. So um, our objective is uh, to explore the question of uh, the optimization of the light characteristic for designing a smart lighting system to assist uh, visual impairments. Uh, in this research, we will vary the beam angle of the light source and assess the visual equity and uh, activity performance. Uh, for experimental design, I will start with the design of the light source. LED luminaire will be totally used in this research, and these parameters are also determined to be the, the initial characteristic of uh, LED including uh, the spectral power distribution and the light distribution curve. In the view of uh, the experimental room, it will contain uh, many tables, chairs, windows, doors, and uh, especially uh, the LED luminaire, which will be installed symmetrically on the ceiling, as you see in uh, the figure. Moreover, this LED will be also vary the beam angle by uh, LED lenses. And then for the experiments, firstly, as you see from the previous slide, we have uh, many tables under each lighting conditions. And we will select the table of uh, A-lux illuminance, B-lux illuminance, and uh, C-lux illuminance to performing our design experiments. Refer to each selected illuminance table. There are three experiments on this table. The first one is the visual equity with the log MAR chart. The second one is the color perception with the different colors of the objects. And the last one is the characteristic classification with the different sizes of the object. And finally, uh, for the conclusion of uh, this research, based on uh, the complicated circumstance uh, in France and also in Japan, I will exhibit to you uh, for three timelines of uh, the research summary, as I have already did. Uh, in the past, I completely finished the backup theoretical review, which directly led to uh, the entire experiment and design and based on the existing principle and state of the art research. And now at the present, actually, this research could not be finished completely due to the complicated circumstance, as I, I, I told you, but we are still always working hard for revising the details, methods, experiments, and whole the research. Of course, in the near future, we have already planned to, do, uh, to continue this research. And this research will have a continued literally during the summer uh, in M2 maybe in the next month at on-site laboratory. Eventually, this research could not be done without uh, these two uh, supervisor, uh, supervisor Elik Dinnet from UJM and supervisor Che Yang Hyo from Chimane University in Japan. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for your PCS time and feel free to uh, remove your doubt with the question. Thank you. <coughs> we don't have much time for question, but if someone have one question, maybe I have one, but uh, if someone has one. So just, it's not clear for me how uh, your solution, so you have lights on, on the roof and yes. uh, how this light interact with natural light from the outside? And uh, is it adaptive or, or not? For example, if 
there is a lot of sun outside. Maybe the light should uh, be different if there is rain ah, okay. outside or something like this. Ah, okay. Uh, in our experiment, we control the light from outside. We ah, okay. uh, Yes, we do the experiment on the uh, control room. We have uh, um, the wall, we have the door that have the certain, the black certain to protect the light from outside. Oh, so okay. we can control all the light inside the room. Yes. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, so if you have any question, you can ask in the chat and he will reply in the chat. Uh, okay, so thank you so much. The ninth speech is from Melanie Nguyen. So if you can connect uh, Melanie Nguyen and share your screen, switch on your cam. So maybe I don't know if your mic is off. We don't hear you. We see your screen. It's black at the moment. But we don't hear you. Okay. So here we see you. Can you hear ah, me now? Yeah. I got some hear. trouble with my mic. Okay, so we hear you. We see uh, your presentation. It's not in full screen, but if you. Yeah, I can put it in full ah, okay. screen. Is it good now? Yeah, you can begin. Perfect. So today I'm going to talk about artistic half tone screening, printing images always needs many techniques in various applications in the daily life. As an example, packaging are printed by bitmap for economizing ink. We can also notice uh, some half printing on official documents like passport or ID card for recognizing false papers among the real one at border controls. But also some artists like uh, Roy Lichtenstein, which is uh, an icon in the comic art, arts, art and bitmap and solid colors in their creations. After this observation, this half-tone screening may look really simple and only made of lot of simple pattern. The main goal now is to make a, a graphical innovation, something more artistic for a renewal in the printed technique. But how to print uh, these images? It is uh, print by spread ink according to the rule of the all or nothing. So we compare the image with a different matrix. For each pixel, we, con we compare its intensity value with the one on the different matrix. If its value is higher than the one on the different matrix, it will be white on the half-tone images. But in the contrary case, it will be black. This is how we make the binarization of an image. But now we know how uh, uh, to half tone an image. For having the artistic part of uh, the process, we need to have a more complex pattern. For example, here we have uh, letters or animals, which are still recognizable how bold and how dark they are. Here for the birds and the fish by Escher, who is a Dutch artist, artist uh, who was known for his inquiry based on mathematic rules. But the shape are and the color are still recognizable when the, the images is dark or light. In my case, I have a chosen Pegasus by Escher. For creating uh, this Pegasus, uh, which fit each other without any free space, I have only worked on, the, on one vertical and one horizontal side and uh, I have applied the same variation on the opposite side of the Pegasus. But for having a good beta matrix, we need to have all the shade of gray inside the Pegasus and also for keeping the global shape after half toning. So from the base style, I have calculated the, the distance inside the Pegasus. So we can see in the middle the skeleton, but it is composed of a lot of small uh, 
spur. So I print it for only keeping the the main uh, skeleton, and I make it thicker for a better visualization after the half toning. Then I calcul I have calculated the distance uh, between the skeleton and the border of the image. Then, after having these two distances, we make a calculation with these two distances for having the ether matrix for only one Pegasus. Uh, inside, you have all the shade of gray between the, the spurred skeleton, which is in white, and the border, which is in black. Then, we make the convolution for uh, repeating uh, these uh, Pegasus for having the ether matrix, and now it is ready for a half tone on the enemy on the image but for having something more artistic more complex why not try to have something less linear or periodic so we can apply some some mathematic transformation for having maybe an effect of volume or something less uh, boring than just a uh, geometrical padding then we can directly ap apply it on some uh, Photos here we we can make some variation of parameters on the photo. For example, the resolution, so we can have bigger or, or smaller pattern, or we can make some variation on the parameters of the mathematical formula. So on the top, we can have a, a bigger amplitude of uh, the sinusoid if we want. So as a conclusion, we have. Here, a graphical innovation by having kind of uh, an images inside another images, and we have um, almost an infinite an infinity of possibilities uh, for the creation. Now, the next way is maybe to try to apply it on the colored image and uh, going further. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this presentation. For it's a mix between art and mathematics, I think. Yes. Uh, so I don't know if there is one question. OK, so maybe in the chat, if you want, later. So there is one. Thank you very much for your presentation. So now uh, there is still one presentation for a group from a group of uh, four students. So. It will be a little bit longer, so I think we will use the remaining time for this session. So I call Fouad Bouzerara, Jonathan Chartier, Baptiste Jans, and Simona Stenlin. So you can switch on your cam and share what screen. 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 So we see Fouad Bouderara, Jonathan Chartier share the screen. Okay. So you, if you can put it in full screen, okay, it's nice. So you can begin your presentation. Thank you. Just give me a second. So, good morning, everyone. We are going to present you some mathematical methods for the generation of graphical patterns. So thanks to modern scientific means, we are able to create aesthetically uh, pleasing patterns. Uh, however, it doesn't mean that everything created that way is relevant. So first, I will talk about different ways of generating fractals. Um, so the fractal is a never-ending pattern, which is self-similar or quite different scales. They are created by repeating a simple process over and over, most of the time it's by recursion. Such never-ending patterns can even be, be found in our natural environment. Here are some examples such as the cauliflower and the fern. So I will explain you an, uh, an example, the dragon curve, which is one of the easiest fractals to understand, and how to create it. So as shown in the first figure, we have to Start from a base segment, replace each segment by two segments with a right angle um, and with a rotation of 45 degrees, alternately to the right and to the left, as shown with the first figure. Um, with the two last pictures, we can see uh, what we obtain with 10 iteration and 20 iteration. We can also see that there is some 
um, particularities, such as the curve never cross itself. Each fractals have um, their, fa their particularities. Um, now I will talk about the Newton's method and the Newton fractal. So as you know, the Newton method is used to find the roots of a function. And we can use this method to see uh, a map of the convergence speed of a function, as shown with the two last uh, figures. So uh, with this color map, the color represents the convergence speed, and the um, big blue dot represents the basins of convergence, which correspond to the roots of um, the function. So with the two last figures, we can see the root of unz, which is represented by this uh, three uh, lessons of correction. We can generalize uh, this method uh, by adding a complex um, argument before the, the function. And there is also a 2D space, and it's exactly the same thing. And uh, we can observe what happens if the series diverge or converge. If the series diverge, we obtain nothing, as shown with the first figure. But if it's converged, you can have some information and uh, some aesthetic results. Um, and it leads us to the Jula set, uh, which is um, which, which consists of values such as um, that an arbitrary small perturbation can cause drastic change in the sequence of iterated function value. So we can say this set is chaotic. So that's what uh, figure one highlights. And the Jula set can lead to the Mandelbrot set. Um, so the first picture corresponds to the Jula set. And this set, the, the Mandelbrot set makes, makes it possible to index the Jula set at each point of the complex plane, which corresponds to a different, um, to different Jula sets which uh, is indexed on the second picture, and we can see uh, an animated version of it of the Jula set. So with these um, factors, uh, in the, we can get some aesthetic results. So in the end, these aesthetic patterns may prove very useful because some of them are exploited commercially to make profit. So we can use mathematic patterns to generate art and make profits with aesthetic results. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, in this part, we are going to use reflection in order to generate artistic graphic patterns. Next. Let's first recall some uh, elements of geometrical optics for conic curves. In the case of the nadex, all rays issued from a focus converge to the other focus. Parabolas are limit curves of uh, the family of ellipses, where the second focus tends to infinity. It means that rays issued from the focus are reflected in parallel to the axis of the parabola. Of, uh, the parabola. In uh, a reverse way, rays coming from a source located uh, at infinity on the axis conver uh, converge to the focus. Thus, a parabolic mirror is perfectly stigmatic for a pair infinity focus. Next. However, if uh, rays coming from infinity are not parallel to the axis, they no longer converge to the focus. Instead, the reflected rays make an envelope, also called a plastic, similar to the letter alpha. Next. Uh, instead of uh, a unique reflection, we will now deal with multiple reflections. We introduce the model of uh, the elliptic BR. A ball is sent from a fixed position on uh, the BR table with a given angle and undergoes multiple reflections. We generate nice patterns uh, that have a common feature. Uh, they delimitate extrusion areas that are either bordered by nadips or by hyperbolic arcs. Uh, these conic curves also share the same focal points with the elliptic table. Next. We can also evaluate the variation of the graphic patterns due to the initial vector. First, we fix the initial vector, uh, the initial position of the ball uh, near the center of the ellipse. Then we start to increase the angle between the initial vector and the focal line. We notice uh, an increase in the size of the extrusion area. Next. 
so an extension uh, an extension of uh, the elliptic VR model is possible to concave shapes. Uh, we have to take into account that a ray issued from the border, a point in the border, potentially hits the border on several points, as you can see here. We have to evaluate their distances from the, the initial point and keep the shortest. Uh, we just had to add uh, an if statement in, uh, to the algorithm, and uh, now it works on all shapes. Next. Uh, so here is an example of the BR table model <laughs> for uh, two unusual concave shapes. Uh, in this case, it becomes very complicated to determine the exclusion areas. Uh, next. Ne uh, so to conclude this part, uh, here are some uh, of the most prominent artistic figures that we got by using reflection on conic figures. Thank you. But the uh, next. So, uh, my work is with three curves that are not defined uh, by explicit uh, expression of uh, x, y, and z, where s is uh, the curvilina abscissa, uh, but uh, with curves defined by two parameters, uh, curvature and uh, torsion. So, the curvature measures the failure of the curve line, and uh, the torsion measures the failure of the curves to be. Um, in the auscultating plane. And so if there is no torsion, the curve is uh, planar. Uh, next. So uh, the theoretically and practically, the way one deals uh, with curvature and torsion is based on uh, the following differential uh, system called the Serre-Frenet equation uh, involving an anti-symmetric uh, matrix where uh, we recognize uh, the curvature and the torsion. And uh, we are going to use uh, the facility offered by uh, MATLAB. This software uh, possesses a differential system, uh, a differential system solver based on a solving method called uh, Runge-Kuta. Um, next. So here are some examples. The classical uh, helix curve on the right with uh, constant curvature and torsion. And uh, on the center, we have a spring like uh, helix. And on the right, uh, the curvature has increased from one to three. So this explains why uh, the radius of curvature is smaller. And uh, on the left, another original example. Uh, next. Um, so here on the left is a more complicated uh, basket-like uh, figure, and we would have a uh, hard time to look for an analytical uh, analytical form for it. And uh, uh, on the right, uh, another interesting example. Uh, next. So here are some uh, other interesting curves. Uh, on the right, curvature and torsion. Uh, fit uh, perfectly a sphere, and uh, on the left we can see that even with a constant uh, torsion, we can uh, obtain a quite uh, complex figure. Uh, next, so from now on we will use uh, tubes generated by a different program using uh, the Serifrené as a kind of a drilling device. And uh, this offers us a greater degree of freedom, and uh, we can change the width of the tube, the color, and uh, thanks to MATLAB option, we can uh, even add some uh, light. Next. And uh, finally, uh, as a final application, I would like to present an original ID using uh, these 3D curves to generate texture, uh, as in the work of uh, Melanie. Thank you. Tu es en mute, Simon. Simon, tu es en mute. Bon. On ne t'entend toujours pas. Mm -hmm. 
Est-ce qu'il y en a un de vous qui peut prendre le relais ou il n'y a que lui qui peut parler sur ces slides-là Il n'y a que lui qui peut parler sur ces slides-là. C'est un peu le problème. Euh, bah sinon, Simon, tu peux venir si tu veux, vu que tu es juste à côté. <rire> sinon, c'est pas votre casque qui bloque le, le son Les autorisations, peut-être. Peut-être autoriser le micro. Donc, il fait quoi, là, votre collègue Allô Is it working now Ah, yes. OK. You got... Sorry. So, um, my work is dealing with differential equations, and uh, we will see different examples, some more classical at the start, and then some more unusual ones. Next. So, uh, currently, we speak a lot about COVID, and uh, a model that's used to model its spread is differential um, compartmental epidemiology. So we can see the equations on the left that are modeling the spread. Uh, and on the right, we can see how the different parameters influence the evolution of the virus. Next. There are different kinds of equations that model population. Here is the load Cavalteri equations with, which model the evolution of two populations, the prey and the predators. And um, as we can see on the bottom left, there are uh, periodical solutions. And on the right, we switch to the phase space where um, plotted here is uh, the population of the predators as, uh, with respect to the population of prey. And because the solutions are periodical, it forms closed loops. And there are slight deviations due to numerical errors. Next. We can generalize this model to uh, any given number of species. So here, uh, for three species, we can move on to the phase space still. But as soon as we move uh, to higher number of species, we can only uh, stay in the temporal state uh, uh, space. Next. There's another very classical uh, example is a logistic equation which deals with the devolution of only one population, but which is limited by um, natural resources. So on the left, there's the continuous model, which has an analytical, an analytical solution. And we can see that it converges always to the same value. On the, on the other hand, on the right, uh, we have the discrete version of the same equation. And uh, for the same value of R, we have some oscillations between different values next for some values of r uh, we can see that some chaotic behavior occurs so on the left we can see that two very close starting position end up uh, arbitrarily far apart after only uh, so some 10 iterations and on the right we plotted the values between which the population oscillates um, as a function of the parameter r Next. So uh, the map that we saw right before is an attractor. And uh, the attractors is the part on which I focus the most. So here we have different examples. There's the Eno attractor that's on the left, and then the Lawrence attractor, which is continuous and based on the model of the atmosphere. Next. Some more unusual attractors uh, are the Clifford attractors. They are defined by the equations below. And by playing on the different parameters A, B, C, and D, we can obtain a very wide range of patterns, and uh, they are shown below. Next. By slowly changing the parameters, we can see the figures going through a very wide spectrum of patterns, and uh, it really shows how influential they are uh, in regards to the results. Next. Another type of attractors I looked at were the symmetric attractors. So as opposed to the other ones, we have some amount of predictability in the results, uh, given that uh, by controlling the variable D, we determine which uh, the number of branches that the figure will have. So as you can see below, there's five, then four, and then 16 branches. Next. And same as the Clifford attractors, by changing the values slowly, we can see some very nice evolution of the shapes. Next. 
Uh, another use of uh, differential equations is to draw control lines for analytical functions. So here we also use the curvilinear abscissa as in Baptist's work. And on the right is drawn the isophase lines of the exponential of sine uh, function. Next. By using this method, we can draw some isomodulus control lines of different function and have some very aesthetically pleasing um, results. Next. Another thing that I did a bit on the um, fringes of the project were tilings. And um, I thought they were fitting right in this project because they're also um, a mix of order and chaos as it would seem very ordered, but as soon as we take a closer look, we see that the pattern is never repeating because these are a periodic timings. Next. So as a conclusion, um, I wanted to say that uh, seeing how different works, we were able to obtain a very wide array of patterns. And um, I think it's undeniable that there is definitely some beauty in it. Thank you. OK, thank you for your presentation. So. This was the last pitch, so we are 11 minutes longer than uh, we should have been for this session. So maybe if you have some question in the chat only, uh, because there is a, a presentation soon after this session. So first, so thank you for your presentation. And uh, for everyone, I would like to thank you all students for the very good job you, <coughs> you did before the session in your work and uh, during the session for your nice presentations. And uh, I want you to congratulate everyone for this work. And uh, just to recall that the uh, the, the award uh, ceremony will be on uh, Friday 15 at noon. Okay. So the jury will say what is the best pitch is the best pitch of this session. 